After years of back and forth, Metro will finally see SROs in some elementary schools. It does deter. What's fueling the change and what parents think? Plus, a day four years in the making. What slowed the rebuilding of this Wilson County school leveled by a tornado? $50 million, not enough. Why some advocates say we need more money to battle Nashville's homeless crisis. Fox 17 News at 9 starts now. Middle Tennessee's only prime time news. This is Fox 17 News at 9, your code red station. It's not just being a school resource officer, it's the relationships that you build. Tonight in Crisis in the Classroom, it's a debate that we've been tracking for years. The push to put school resource officers in Metro Elementary schools. Some in school leadership push back against the plan in years past, but now three Metro Elementary schools will have full time SROs. That's right. Metro Police will start with three schools with the idea of expanding. Fox 17 News Caitlin Miller now live at a school in North Nashville with more on these new school resource officers. Yes, Scott and Megan. Well, right now, all middle school and high schools have school resource officers, but this is also the first year that three elementary schools will have full-time SROs, and they're hoping to have them in eight elementary schools by the end of the calendar year. Metro Police Chief John Drake says Metro schools will have 16 SROs for high schools with two in each school and 30 SROs for middle school with one in each school and three SROs in elementary schools with the goal of expanding this number. Having that as their number one goal to protect and serve and to also keep an eye out for, you know, things going on with kids, right? That's going to help our communities overall. Candace Bridges has two children, one going into the fourth grade and another going into the ninth grade. And she says she's relieved that both will now have this layer of protection to keep them safe in school. Chief Drake says this is a pivotal moment. It's good that the training that you have, you're able to teach teachers and kids what to do if that kind of situation happens, where, where to go, how to react. So how did Metro Police choose the first three elementary schools to get SROs? We picked the schools we thought we could have a, a pilot that could be successful in a particular neighborhood. Chief Drake explains his captain worked closely with MNPS to look at the different school clusters and also look at the highest enrollment. Fox 17 News reached out to Dr. Adrian Battle, director of Metro Schools, and she says she appreciates a strong partnership with MNPD and says they've been working with them to expand SRO coverage to elementary schools as staffing allows, and they're committed to the protection of all schools. It does deter, right? We, we know that from different um, manifestos that people have not gone to schools because of the police presence. Some people were against having SROs in elementary schools because they were concerned about a possible spike in arrests of school students and having an armed officer around young children. Metro Police say that the goal is to have SROs in all elementary schools, so right now they're focusing on getting the staffing to do so. Reporting live from North Nashville, I'm Caitlin Miller, Fox 17 News, your Code Red Station. And we want to know what you think. Do you agree with Metro's decision to now place SROs in elementary schools? And we've had 315 votes come in so far tonight. 93.7% say yes. 6.3% say no. This poll live right now to cast your vote. You can scan the QR code right there on your screen. It will take you to our X page. And you can vote there and we'll show you updated poll results here tonight at 10. Continuing coverage as not only will parents see more SROs in Metro schools this fall, but some of our Metro school buildings are already outfitted with ballistic film on the glass to keep the bad guys out. In the wake of the Covenant school shooting in Green Hills in March of last year, Metro accepted money from the state to improve safety. So far, Metro has upgraded the glass at 45 Nashville schools with more on the way. Metro says it's doing this work in stages. Ballistic film also is not just for the outdoor windows, all also inside the building. They'll have that on the inside as well. Wilson County Schools headed back to class today and with the brand new school year comes the long awaited grand reopening of West Wilson Middle School. An EF3 tornado took out part of the building in March of 2020 right before COVID hit and now four years later the doors are open again. 
These hallways tell a story, a noticeably new fresh coat of paint coupled with an echoed greeting at West Wilson Middle School. Classrooms donning the message, welcome home warriors. Students starting to fill the hallways, the parent drop off line in motion, all telling signs that school is back in session. It's like Christmas, you know, uh, not a lot of sleep last night, just excited about getting in here and, and having the kids finally be in, uh, in our new home and, and getting settled in. This is an extra special first day of school, a long time in the making. The school district spent over four years rebuilding the middle school after an EF3 tornado devastated the area in March of 2020, shortly before COVID shut down the rest of the world. Since then, and up until today, sixth through eighth grade students zoned for West Wilson had been split up, attending classes at Mount Juliet Middle and Mount Juliet High School. So they came in with great attitudes, flexible, uh, and so it's been humbling to kind of be able to see them work for the last four years uh, and, and keep calm and carry on, and, uh, and now we, we get rewarded today. With the new rebuild of West Wilson Middle School, there are new thoughtfully added features that make it better than before. We've got a tornado shelter that we have that uh, in the middle of the building uh, because we do have staff members and students who, who lost their homes. And so uh, the district kept that in mind when they, were, when they were designing this place. And so that extra layer of security for us during stormy days really, really helps. These hallways tell a story of strength and resilience, a legacy that hopes to be instilled in the students that walk through the doors. And of course, we are wishing them a safe school year out in Wilson County. Williamson County students will head back to class on Monday. Davidson County students head back on Tuesday and Robertson and Sumner County schools start back on Wednesday of next week. That means next week's going to be busy and as we continue our back to school coverage, students in Clarksville are returning to the classroom Wednesday as well. Police there reminding drivers to slow down and here's a reminder for all of us when it comes to sharing the road with school buses, which uh, we all will soon be doing. If it's a two lane road like you see in this diagram, You've got to stop on both sides, behind the bus, also in front of the bus until the kids get where they're going, whether it's that side or the kids are coming around here. Now, if it's a road where you've got a turn lane, and there are a lot of those, especially in the bigger cities, to keep traffic moving. Unfortunately, if there's a bus, you've got to stop both, uh, both ways. When that bus is stopped and the uh, stop arm is out there, that means you stop in both of these directions. However, if you happen to be uh, on uh, a road uh, that's got a, a divided highway where there's an unpaved area, area in the middle or maybe one of those concrete barricades right down there. You do have to stop behind the bus until the kids, you know, are off either this way or if they're coming around uh, to something on this side of the road. However, if you're on this side of the road, you can proceed with caution and uh, just watch, uh, make sure you know young people are in harm's way. And uh, we also wanted you to know that uh, in Mount Juliet, folks there are stepping up patrols throughout the year. Many of you should have noticed an increased presence of our officers in school zones and around bus stops throughout our community. This is a part of our ongoing commitment to ensuring safe areas around all of our schools. Well, schools in Wilson County busy today. Mount Juliet officers out there and Deputy Chief Chandler, who spoke with us, says that his officers will be offering increased patrols in school zones around his city throughout the school year as they work to keep our children safe. Now, we want to see your children's backpacks as we get ready to go back to school. Show us your pictures, specifically what's in them. Go to our website, fox17.com. Look all the way up at the top and uh, click on Chime In, and uh, you can share your pictures or video of your child's backpack and what's in them. In Operation Crime and Justice, less than 24 hours after being released from Metro Jail, police say a registered sex offender attacked two women in Nashville. 27-year-old Deontes Drew was released from the Hardeman County Jail in Bolivar on Wednesday. He's accused of assaulting a woman on Mission Street near downtown Nashville the next morning, and then another woman on Pine Street a few hours later. Police say that he hit one of the women with a baseball bat. Someone who lives near the second victim tracked Drew until police arrived, taking him back into custody. He's now facing attempted criminal homicide and especially aggravated robbery. <laughs> 
Tonight, Sumner County residents are mourning the passing of longtime Sheriff Sonny Weatherford. County Mayor John Isbell praising Weatherford for his courage and determination when facing countless challenges over the years. Mayor Isbell says that Weatherford always put the safety of others above his own. Oh, well, here we go. So uh, radar is still showing a little bit of activity. I'll show you that here in just a little bit. But uh, radar, this is a radar loop from over the past several hours, and you can see that we had some of those severe thunderstorm warnings that the National Weather Service had to issue a little bit earlier on today. Uh, really not seeing much on the radar right now. Here's that little outflow boundary. You can see that little thin line that's dropping down. That was dropping down earlier this evening, and I was talking about how a lot of times you can get some storms to develop on that. We'll fast forward just a couple more hours from then, and you can see that's when those storms started to fire up, and here's what we're left with right now. So still some of those storms that kind of developed along that outflow boundary just about to push out of our viewing area. This is the current radar image 911 at the current time and uh, some of these storms moving through the very far southern portions of Cumberland County. There's Crossville right there not seeing much rain in the Crossville area just about to exit out of Van Buren County. White County seeing a little bit of that too. Sparta seeing some rain. This is the strongest storm that we have now that's moved off into Coffee County. Manchester seeing some of that heavy rainfall. A lot of lightning with that storm too. Maybe a little bit of wind but I don't think we're gonna have to worry about any more severe weather as we go through the rest of the night. Storm Prediction Center also took away that level one risk that we had right here for us. So no severe weather threat for the overnight hours. So that is some very good news. 79 our current temperature right here in Nashville, but it is going to get hot as we head into the middle and end of this upcoming week. I'll show you just how hot it's going to get and what our rain chances are looking like coming up here in just a little bit. A growing homeless camp causing growing problems. Do you have trust in the prioritization process and the high cost of homelessness? Calls to shut down a well-known homeless camp in downtown Nashville. Old Tent City has been around for years. Now a local nonprofit says that Metro just needs to expend more resources to close this camp. Fox 17 News Kylie Walker tonight taking a closer look at the money. In May 2022, Metro agreed to invest $50 million to address homelessness, but some feel that things are moving too slow. Now remember, Metro does have a coordinated entry system to get people into housing, and that's based off of vulnerability and other factors. In January of 2023, this well-known homeless encampment in Brookmead Park shut down after over a decade. It was part of phase one in the city's welcome home housing surge. And early in 2024, in phase two, another well-known homeless encampment shut down in Hermitage. This after years of community complaints. And after at least four camps have been shut down through the city's phase plan, now community advocates want to see Old Tent City address next. How are you guys? Barry Dupnik, who's been cleaning up the homeless encampments across the city for years, says Old Tent City is the biggest in the Tri-County area, calling on immediate action. I've been down there for about two and a half years. Um, trying to, you know, clean and, and help people get out of that situation. Uh, but it is a massive camp, so there's a lot of drug use. Right now, the Office of Homeless Services won't disclose what camps will be addressed next. But the prioritization team will base it off vulnerability, people, location, and environment. Do you have trust in the prioritization process? Yes, I have trust in the process because I trust the people who are on the team. Lisa Waisaki with Colby's Army works with many others on the prioritization team, and she says they're going into encampments for daily assessments with dozens currently on their radar. Evaluating. Brookmead and evaluating Old Tent City, and there were several other camps that we evaluated at that same time. Uh, Brookmead was the clear, the clear winner, and um, uh, as far as you know, scoring high. This is the form prioritization teams use. They look for things like overdoses, mental health issues, and over 20 other factors before giving a final score. Waisaki says the city also needs more resources. There's not enough housing, not enough outreach workers out on the street, and not enough mental health providers. Of course, this is a story that I'll continue to stay on. For now, reporting in Nashville, Kylie Walker, Fox 17 News, Sioux Cutter Station. <laughs> Continuing the high cost of homelessness tonight, Nashville's Office of Homeless Services has been tackling issues surrounding the city's homeless population for a year. And in that time, Mayor Freddie O'Connell says the agency housed nearly 2,000 people. He says with help from the Office of Homeless Services, the numbers continue to grow. 
So far in 2024, through the first six months, Nashville housed 942 people, including 154 families with children. So we complete our $50 million investment. I'm looking forward to how we take the very best of that work and move it forward to end the experience of homelessness for more people and connect them to resources that help them thrive. Well, Mayor O'Connell also recognized the recent opening of the Strobel House. It's a permanent housing facility featuring 90 homes and other support services on site. All right, let's talk about your weather for the first time in I don't know how many days. We're not in code red. That's a good thing. That is a very good thing. It means no late nights for us up here. Everybody can just go to bed peacefully. So good news right there. We're not going to have to worry about any sort of severe weather threat. We were code red for the 530 show. Uh, we had a couple of severe thunderstorm warnings, but we have been able to drop that. So not having to deal with any sort of bad code red weather as we go through the overnight hours tonight. And uh, really, I think for the next probably six, seven days, we're not going to have to deal with much of a rain chance at all. A very slow slim chance for some showers for tomorrow. I'll show you that here in just a little bit though. Radar over the past several hours, it was kind of active, mainly along in east of Interstate 65. Uh, we did have to have a couple of severe thunderstorm warnings that the National Weather Service office here in Nashville had to issue for some gusty winds. This is our current radar image, 919, the current time. All this green, that is not rain. This down here though, that is rain. So we are still seeing some of these heavier rain showers right down here just south of Crossville. Uh, just now moving out of Van Buren County too, there are a couple of lightning strikes with that thunderstorm there. The heaviest rain is still right there in Coffee County directly over Manchester. We're still seeing some uh, quite a bit of lightning with this one actually right here too. 38 strikes or so over the past uh, 15 minutes with this storm right here. That is just about to exit our viewing area as well though. But if you're in the Manchester area, you're probably hearing the thunder and also that heavy rain that you have going on right now. The good news though, none of these storms will be severe as we go through the rest of the night. Storm Prediction Center also dropped that severe threat for our area right here in parts of Middle Tennessee uh, for the overnight hours and actually most of the country has even lost that severe weather threat. Not really seeing many of those darker shades of green where that level one risk is. So good news right there. Don't think we're going to have to worry about any of that through the overnight hours. Future track is actually still keeping us pretty dry too through the overnight hours. Once that little round moves out uh, across the plateau, this is 7 a.m. tomorrow morning. We'll be off to a dry start tomorrow morning. We could see just a few isolated showers and thunderstorms develop later on tomorrow. I think the best chance for that will be right here along the plateau. Most areas will stay dry, partly cloudy skies throughout most of the day. Day. Sunday morning, if you're heading out to church early in the morning, it should be an all dry day for you and we're going to stay dry through nearly all of Sunday. This model does bring in just a very slim chance for an isolated shower on Sunday afternoon, but I, I would be surprised even if that happens. I think it's nearly going to be all dry on a Sunday and then especially once we hit Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we're going to keep those dry conditions in place. This is Wednesday morning. We're off to a dry start. Carry that over into Thursday as well. Once we get past Thursday, models kind of begin to spread out a little bit. We have some models that are showing an even bigger warm up as we hit the later part of the week on into the weekend. There is another set of models though that is showing a better chance for some rain showers. So we'll just have to wait and see how that plays out. Either case is possible later on this week, but that's still not until about Friday or so. Good news. All this rain that we've had when Scott was talking about those code red weather days, it has helped our drought. So that is at least some good news areas along and north of I 40 not really having to deal with any drought. All this area in tan that is now level one drought. Uh, a week ago or so that was level two drought. We even had level three out of four drought down here in portions of uh, areas like Lawrence County, uh, Giles County as well, close to Interstate 65. 79 degrees, our current temperature in Nashville, Broadway. A lot of folks out there right now and uh, current temperatures, they are in the 70s for most locations except Crossville in the upper 60s. We do have a few lower 80s on the map. High temperatures will go up this upcoming week though. I'll let you know just how hot we're going to get on some of these days here in just a little bit. Also, we had the scary part of back to school advice on how to help your children adjust. I'm Keel Gaskins in Washington. Coming up, we'll share details on new whistleblower allegations regarding the Secret Service. Individual SUVs for individuals. Imagine that. Get offers on select models at the Lexus Golden Opportunity sales event. Fox 17 News, winner of the prestigious regional Edward R. Murrow Award for our continuing coverage of Who Failed Ariel Rose. Murrow Award-winning stories put public interest above all else, providing a catalyst for public discussion. The Murrow Awards are among the most respected journalism awards in the world. Our continuing coverage on Ariel Rose shined a light on a problem that may have gone unnoticed, 
helping spark change in Middle Tennessee. Fox 17 News, winner of the Regional Murrow Award. Ben and BM is swinging for the fences. The best place to bet the long ball all season long. Out of the park odds on home runs. Exclusive signature bets. And a weekly shot at your share of 50K in bonus bets. Enter the 50K Grand Slam jackpot. It's on. After a car crash, the big insurance companies you see advertising on TV, they may try to downplay your case and might say it's only a fender bender or it's just a herniated disc. I worry that some law firms fall for this BS, not us. We put ourselves in your shoes and ask, what would it be like to be in your pain for the rest of our lives? A million dollars wouldn't be enough for me. There's only one Morgan & Morgan for the people.com. 17 News, your code red station. We track severe weather. Using our code red alerts up to three days in advance. Warning you to weather that will impact your life. Our forecast pinpoint a storm's path, showing when it will hit your neighborhood. That's where we already at. This low pressure system looks like it will be arriving in Brentwood at 415 on Wednesday. Providing you the information needed to prepare and stay safe. Fox 17 News, your code red station. Alerts, empowers, protects. Individual SUVs for individuals. Imagine that. Get offers on select models at the Lexus Golden Opportunity sales event. Questions remain tonight about the assassination attempt several weeks back on former President Trump and congressional lawmakers are pushing the U.S. Secret Service to give some more details. Well, Fox 17 News Kayla Gaskins with new whistleblower allegations. And by the way, we want to know what you think. You can scan the QR code that will appear here shortly on your screen during this story. The assassination attempt. The Secret Service giving a rare press conference Friday to address new whistleblower allegations regarding the security failures at Trump's rally in Butler, Pennsylvania. This was a failure. We should have had better protection uh, for the protectee. We should have had better coverage on that roof line. The whistleblower placing blame directly on the new acting director of the Secret Service, Ronald Rowe, for decisions he made serving as the agency's second in command. The individual telling Senator Josh Hawley Rowe personally directed cuts to the Secret Service's counter surveillance division. This is the team responsible for conducting threat assessments at sites prior to events. According to the whistleblower, this team did not do the typical evaluation of the site prior to the rally, and they weren't even there the day of. We are working through kind of uh, what our needs are right now. Uh, we will uh, have future conversations about this, and we are appreciative that everyone is, is really coming together to make sure that we have what we need to meet this high threat. The individual alleges Rose Cuts reduced manpower in the division by 20 percent, something the acting director did not mention when asked by Congress about staffing levels. Also this week, new video from the Butler rally showing the shooter doing a very poor job of hiding himself and blatantly running across the rooftop. The New York Times digging into the technical failures. The Secret Service missed radio messages from local law enforcement that would have alerted them to the gunman 30 seconds before he fired. They turned down offers to use a surveillance drone, and they didn't bring a system to boost agents' cell signals in an area with poor cell service. Some of the important equipment they did bring didn't work. As a result of these failures, as pointed out by the Times, a 20-year-old gunman had a technological advantage over a $3 billion agency. In Washington, I'm Kayla Gaskins. Well, during that story, we had a QR code linked up to this poll asking the question, are you confident the Secret Service can protect presidents and candidates? The results, there on your screen. Almost 300 people weighing in. 81.8% of you say no, you're not confident that the Secret Service can protect presidents and candidates. 18.2% say yes. Just ahead on Fox 17 News at 9, easing fears, some advice on how you can better help your children as they return to the classroom. 
and getting a helping hand with the transition can be a difficult one for some children and sometimes families. Joining us now with more on that is Dr. Kevin Stevens, who is the senior chief medical officer at United Healthcare. Dr. Stevens, thanks for doing this. If you will, tell us uh, how important routines are for children in general and specifically as it pertains to school. Well, particularly kids need to have certainty. They need to have boundaries and uh, something predictable and they can get in the habit. And that will actually last them through the adulthood that they can become consistent, reliable, dependable, and they know what to expect and they know what is expected from them so they can meet expectations. Oh, yeah. A lot of times what happens, they don't have any idea what you expect them to do or behaviors and those kind of things. And so that's why it's so important to have traditions and some boundaries as well as traditions. Okay. Is it true that being away from home, because of course we've got some kids going to school for the first time, can induce fear, sort of a separation, anxiety, maybe especially for those kindergartners, first graders? Absolutely. Kids are, are so fragile sometimes, and they're so lovely, but many times they have been at home with their parents, and this is their first real time away from parents for extended periods of time, and so they can feel a little nervous, a little anxious, and they don't know what to expect. They have new people, new classroom, new books, new tasks. Uh, and that could be a little scary for kids. So I think it's important that we support and be supportive and tell them, you know, we all have done this. We all have gone through. You can do fine. And we are here to help you. So we're not going to let you uh, fail. We're going to help you to be successful. I know when it comes to mental health, uh, there can be a stigma, even for adults. I'm certain that it's true among children as well to say, hey, I've got a problem. Um, I'd like to talk about something. How do you or how is I a parent? Uh, how can I help my child speak up if that's the case? Well, the first thing is you, you have to ask. Uh, and one of the things our son told us is that, hey, Dad, you didn't ask us. <laughs> so the first thing, how you doing? How are you feeling? Is there anything you want to talk about? And then you give reassurance and say, you know, your parents, we love you, we're here for you. And if you have any questions or problems, feel free to come and uh, we can talk about it, we can discuss it. And as the kids get older, it, you become more of an advisor because then you can tell them advice and those types of things as opposed to being directive. Uh, because as they get older and independent, you want them to have some degree of independence where they can make decisions and that you can be supportive of it. Sure, this is great advice. Dr. Kevin Stevens, Senior Chief Medical Officer at United Healthcare. thanks so much for doing this. Okay, thank you very much. And anytime, we are happy to help out our kids because that's our future. If you need help getting the kids ready to head back to school, Fox 17 is co-sponsoring the Ride to Thrive Back to School Family Fun Day tomorrow. We'll have free backpacks stuffed with school supplies. Metro Social Services will provide family support services. And there will be live music, games, and free food. Former Titans players will be there as well, like Al Smith, Brad Hopkins, and Chris Sanders. That's tomorrow from 1130 to 3 at the Metro Social Services building at 3055 Lebanon Road in Hermitage. Well, the weather here across Middle Tennessee and Southern Kentucky has finally calmed down. So uh, I want to go ahead and just talk about the tropics for a minute right now. There is a little bit of activity that's going on in the tropics. This is right around the Cuba area. And uh, there is this storm, we'll say, with uh, poorly defined circulation. So right now it's called Potential Tropical Cyclone 4. It's moving to the west northwest at 16 miles per hour. Maximum winds at 30 miles per hour. Some heavy rain down there. Parts of the Florida coast and the Gulf Coast. Other Gulf Coast states uh, could be seeing some heavy rain a little bit later on in this weekend. Right now, the National Hurricane Center's projected path of this is kind of taking it up across Cuba through the Gulf of Mexico and uh, having it make landfall along the Florida coast early Monday morning. Notice that we're going to stay on the west side of that system, and whenever we're dealing with those tropical systems, it's a lot of times those areas kind of on the northeast in the eastern side that are going to get those outer bands and some of the stronger storms. So I don't think that's going to have a whole lot of an effect on us for later on in the week. 91 degrees, the forecast high temperature for tomorrow. We are going to be drier. We've had just daily rounds of showers and thunderstorms over the past 
few weeks now, it seems like. We are going to enter a much more uh, dry period, though, as we head through the next several days. We're also going to heat up, too. Here's our temperature trend up to the upper 90s by Monday and Tuesday. Only drops down a little bit Wednesday, Thursday. Friday, 94 right now, but if some of the other models uh, verify a little bit later on in the week, we could see those temperatures going up even higher than that for the end of the week and into the weekend. Some are bringing in a better chance for rain. Others are bringing in a chance for more heat. It is going to stay pretty muggy, too, as we head through the next several days. Heat index values are going to be back to the triple digits early this upcoming week. Dry, though, once we get past tomorrow, only a 20% chance, and it's looking pretty much all dry for the next several days. Looking ahead to Sunday in Nashville in focus when our panel goes deep on the three hotly contested congressional races set up by the results of Thursday primary elections across the state. State Representative Gloria Johnson getting 70% of the vote in a crowded Democratic U.S. Senate race. She moves on to face the incumbent Senator Marsha Blackburn, who got 89% of the primary vote on the Republican side. But can Johnson compete with Blackburn, who has the endorsement of former President Trump in November? Democrats concede it's an uphill battle. Can we galvanize enough energy so that we can flip some seats on the lower um, down ballot races. Uh, and, and so and I think that that's going to be the objective this cycle uh, because taking back Tennessee is going to be more than just a one cycle thing. Other topics on Sunday morning include President Trump calling Governor Bill Lee a rhino, a Republican in name only, and Metro winning its latest legal battle against the state. That's Sunday morning, 630, right here on Nashville in Focus. Taking off the pup list. The Tennessee Titans taking a big hit this week as we learn veteran wide receiver DeAndre Hopkins will be out at least a month with a knee injury. The team did get some good news today, however, as offensive lineman Nicholas Petit Frere is now healthy and back practicing with the Titans. Petit Frere passed his physical, which meant the Titans could officially remove him from the pup list, also known as the physically unable to perform list. He missed the first five practices of camp while rehabbing a knee injury. Petit Frere played in 19 games his first two seasons and is expected to compete for the starting right tackle spot right away. Tennessee Vols opening up preseason camp this week on Rocky Top and all eyes are on second year quarterback Nico Iamaliava. The red shirt freshman is expected to start at quarterback this season, marking his first season as the full starter. He was ranked as the number one recruit in the class of 2023 by on three, but then he sat out last season under quarterback Joe Milton. Ian Maliava did start in the Citrus Bowl, however, for the Vols, where he threw four touchdowns in Tennessee's win over Iowa. Ian Maliava says he learned a lot from Milton last season and is excited to take that next step as a leader. I mean, when you got a guy like Joe in front of you, I feel like, you know, it's a great guy to learn from. You know, soak up as much as you can soak up. And, and uh, yeah, I enjoy learning from Joe and uh, this whole team, just, you know, how to be a leader. And uh, it was good for me to sit. As for the Commodores, the quarterback competition just now starting to heat up. Vanderbilt looking at four different QBs this camp. Utah transfer Nate Johnson and New Mexico State transfer Diego Pavier are expected to take the most snaps. And then returning scholarship quarterback Drew Dickey and New Mexico State transfer Blaze Berlowitz are also in the mix as well. Well, right now it's anyone's ball. You know, they got to come out and, and show the ability to protect the football and make good decisions, you know, um, empower the other 10 guys on the field to make plays. Um, and uh, we want to give them time and space to do that. Head coach Clark Lee also saying that the biggest challenge will be narrowing down the competition from four to just one starter. They have already have a strategy, though, in place on how they want to do that when it comes to dividing up reps. I'll have much more on the Commodores, Vols, and the Titans Sunday on Sports Overtime at 10, so be sure to join us then. Jill Jelnick, Fox 17 Sports, your Code Red Station. Jill, thank you. Still to come tonight to the Titans We Go, the option making it easier for fans to check out home games. And nailing down transit funding when you can weigh in on the mayor's new plan. Looking ahead, football season's right around the corner, and Titans are getting ready for their fans to return to Nissan Stadium. Well, preseason kicks off next Friday when the Titans take on the San Francisco 49ers, and as Fox 17 News' Peyton Mew shows us, because of construction on the new stadium, fans will have a new way to get to the games. 
It's the Titans Express and round trip tickets cost about $15 plus a $2 processing fee and you have to buy them online. You can't buy them at the physical train station locations. The train starts in Lebanon, stops in Mount Juliet, Hermitage and Donaldson before getting downtown. WeGo tells us the Titans are asking people to use the Woodland Street Bridge instead of the pedestrian bridge. WeGo says it's important to note these tickets are different than the normal WeGo Star tickets. For special trains, we'll always sell tickets at uh, ticketsnashville.com. And so even if you're a regular rider on the commuter side, uh, you'll need to get separate tickets for these. The Titans Express will run for all home games at Nissan Stadium, including preseason games. WeGo says you can bring coolers onto the train and actually leave them here at Riverfront on the train until the game is over, but they are not responsible if anything happens to them, if your cooler gets lost or stolen. And WeGo also says next week they're going to release the bus ticketing deals for the Titans home games. Reporting downtown, Peyton News, Fox 17 News, your Code Red Station. All right, Brett, give it to us this weekend. You know, finally, we got a pattern shift. We were just talking earlier. It has been several days in a row now of just rain after rain after rain, at least for some areas, very scattered. But uh, this upcoming week, if you have any outdoor plans, it's going to be hot, but no rain is going to ruin your plans. <clears throat> we are going to stay dry for several days in a row, it looks like, as we head on into this upcoming week. More on that here in just a second. Here's what radar looks like right now and what it's looked like over the past several hours. All this green that you're seeing up, that big kind of green blob right there, most all of that is not actually rain. Maybe just a couple of rain showers right here along Interstate 40. This is about all we have going on right now. I'm going to stop this picture right here. 947, the current radar image. Nearly all of that shower and thunderstorm activity that we had earlier today has either died on out or just left the viewing area. So we still have a few showers and thunderstorms over here in our more southern and eastern areas. Most areas, though, are very dry right Right now, this is Cumberland County right here. Crossville seeing some of that rain. No thunderstorm activity around Crossville. These are just some rain showers, some dropping some moderate to heavy rainfall. This thunderstorm has now exited our viewing area that just left Van Buren County not too long ago. And then just a little bit south of that, this was the storm that has been moving through Coffee County. Manchester was seeing some heavy rainfall. Looks like we might still be seeing just some moderate to heavy rainfall on the eastern edge of Manchester. Now, not really much thunderstorm activity there, though. The most uh, most of the lightning strikes are now pushing off into Grundy County, which is just outside side of our viewing area just south of Shelbyville. We are still seeing a few showers. No lightning with any of that, though, uh, over there right now. Also, we were in a level one risk. Some of our eastern counties earlier today. Storm Prediction Center has removed that for the overnight hours tonight, so not going to have to deal with any severe weather threat. We have lost all those ingredients. Once the sun set, all those storms, most of them at least, really started the weekend, not having to deal with that threat overnight tonight. As we go on into tomorrow, it's going to be a dry start for us. And then for the afternoon hours, I think most areas Areas will still remain on the dry side, but we could still see a couple of isolated showers develop. <clears throat> the best chance for that should be right there along the plateau. Most areas, though, will be staying at dry for tomorrow. Then as we move on into Sunday, this is Sunday morning, 7 a.m. Another dry start for you early Sunday morning. Most all areas stay dry the rest of Sunday. This model does try to bring in just a couple of isolated showers, but I think that's going to be at best. So nearly all locations, I think, should still stay dry on Sunday. And then Monday on into Tuesday, Wednesday, even into Thursday, I think it's looking like pretty much all dry conditions for us across Middle Tennessee and Southern Kentucky. Once we hit Friday, some of the models start to veer off from what they're thinking. Some set of models bring in more rainfall. Other sets of models keep us dry and increase the heat. So we'll We'll, uh, we'll get a better picture on that the closer we get towards the end of the week. But again, overall, the next several days, I think we are looking pretty dry. The drought situation has improved a lot, too, along and north of I-40, not having to deal with really any drought. Here's your seven-day forecast, mid-90s, Sunday, uh, 91 tomorrow. So we are going to get just a slight break in that high heat. 97, though, it's going to get hot again early next week. Then we'll stay in the upper 90s on Tuesday with plenty of sunshine. Mid-90s for us, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Straight ahead, another step forward, the latest hurdle crossed for National Mayor Freddie O'Connell's transit referendum. And a helping hand, how much the feds pumped into Nashville since the deadly December tornadoes. Hey, I'm Jennifer Waddell from Fox 17 News this morning. When it comes to lowering interest rates, the Federal Reserve looks at several trends to determine how the economy is doing. So coming up Monday. <laughs> Looking ahead to November, when Nashville voters will see the mayor's transportation improvement plan on the ballot. Well, the Davidson County Election Commission giving the green light to ballot language last night, paving the way for the choose how you move plans next step. 
National Mayor Freddie O'Connell says the improvement plan will provide 86 miles of new sidewalks in Music City, modernize traffic lights at more than 600 intersections, expand transit on the city's busiest roads, and increase safety. Mayor O'Connell says the plan was created with input with, uh, from more than 66,000 Nashvillians. He says funding to make the plan a reality is long overdue. One of the last of uh, the top 50 American cities without Excuse any me. kind of dedicated funding for transportation and infrastructure. And this is limiting our ability to uh, join federal partners in more significant infrastructure projects. If voters approve the mayor's proposal come November, he says the program will have benefits across Davidson County. It is your money and records show. The Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, showed up big for Tennessee tornado victims in the past year. The biggest single event, of course, the deadly December tornadoes. Six people in Nashville uh, area were killed, 23 more injured, more than a billion dollars worth of damage like what you see here. FEMA sent $4 million to assist with the local recovery effort. Three million of that is for what's called public assistance. That goes straight to the Davidson government. They can use it to rebuild damaged buildings, roads, anything else torn up by the bad weather throughout the year. Then a million dollars is for individual assistance. That's specifically for the tornadoes we had last December. Now statewide, Tennessee received $91 million from FEMA last year. Nearly half of that, $39 million, went specifically to Tipton County to help rebuild after a devastating March 31st tornado. Fortunately, uh, tonight uh, we are not talking about uh, tornadoes. Thank goodness, no. And you know, last December it was just so active. And December is actually one of our, it's increasingly active. So I think it ranks now seventh. It was dead last. So it's another just month that we have to be kind of prepared for these tornadoes across Middle Tennessee and Southern Kentucky now. So just a little fact there. But anyways, here's what we have going on right now. Some showers and thunderstorms. Never mind. I'm sorry. I'm just. We'll get to that in a minute. How about that? <laughs> that sounds good. Hold that thought. All right. It's the county fair across the mid-state. The big drop. In your community tonight, it's county fair time across the mid-state. And in Williamson County, they are celebrating 20 years of fair festivities. The Williamson County Fair kicked off today. The Ag Expo Center down in Franklin, just off the interstate. They've got carnival rides. You see that there. Fair foods as always, livestock and ag competitions. Organizers say it really does take a community. A lot of folks coming together to make a fair like this a success, especially two decades running. Even prior to our opening in 2005, there were many people who were behind the scenes putting together a beautiful community event that would bring everyone throughout Williamson County together to enjoy safe, family friendly fun. And it is that generally considered, in fact, I'd say widely considered one of the best fairs around. The activities uh, include fireworks down there tonight, which will start any second now. And uh, they're going to close out the fair tomorrow night with another round of fireworks. They will start at 10 o'clock. The Williamson County Fair, as I say, underway runs all the way through next weekend. Metro elementary schools are getting school resource officers for the first time. We'll hear from Police Chief John Drake coming up next. This is Fox 17 News at 10, your code red station. I'm really proud to see this progress. We begin tonight with crisis in the classroom and the addition of uniformed police officers at some metro elementary schools. Now it's a long time coming as we say, a first for the district and it will be starting off slowly as we start the new school year. Fox 17 News, uh, Caitlin Miller live from a school in North Nashville with more on what's behind this change. Scott, Megan, right now there are two SROs in each high school, one school resource officer in each middle school, and now three elementary schools are getting school resource officers. Metro Police Chief John Drake says the goal is to get SROs in every elementary school once they have the proper staffing for it. Fox 17 News reached out to every Metro school board member to see how they felt about this and after some had after some had 
concerns about armed officers being around young children. Now we did not hear back from any of these school board members. We then reached out to Dr. Adrian Battle, director of Metro Schools, and she says she appreciates the strong partnership with MNPD and that they're committed to the protection of all schools. It's good that the training that you have, you're able to teach teachers and kids what to do if that kind of situation happens, where, where to go, how to react. Chief Drake says their goal is to have SROs in eight elementary schools by the end of the calendar year. Now, Metro Police say right now they're really working on getting the staffing up so that they can have school resource officers in all schools. Reporting live from North Nashville, I'm Caitlin Miller, Fox 17 News, your Code Red Station. Caitlin, thank you, and we want to know what you think. In our 9 o'clock newscast, we told you about our X poll tonight, asking if you agree with the decision to put SROs in Metro Elementary Schools. We're up to 338 votes, and uh, more than 94% say yes. We are behind that decision. 5.9% say no. Our thanks to all who voted tonight. Be sure to keep an eye out for a new poll here on Fox 17 on our X page tomorrow. Crisis in the classroom is our ongoing commitment to you, our viewer, our customer, to expose problems in our schools and to look for solutions. If you have a story you'd like to see us cover, tell us about it in an email. Send that to news at fox17.com or you can phone our tip line. You see the number at the bottom of the screen, 615-266-4149. This is a lot of people's lives, you know, at stake and it's going to impact, you know, their futures. In the high cost of homelessness, as community advocates call for the closure of Old Tent City, a well-known homeless encampment downtown, a local nonprofit explains how the city prioritizes camp closures. Earlier this week, Fox 17 News showed you this drone video highlighting living conditions in Old Tent City. Barry Dupnik, who cleans camps across the city, calls it the largest in the Tri-County area. He wants an immediate closure. Lisa Wasaki with Colby's Army explains the process that the city uses for their coordinated entry system to get people out of these camps and into housing. What's the, the capacity that we have to move those people safely and, and productively into other housing units? So those are the types of things. What's the vulnerability of the population? You know, do we have a, an older population there? Do we have people who are uh, chronically ill? Well, this is the form prioritization teams use. They look for things like overdoses, mental health issues, and more than 20 other factors before giving a final score. We had some showers and thunderstorms move across Middle Tennessee and Southern Kentucky earlier this afternoon, even earlier this evening, too. Most of that, though, has now cleared on out of our viewing area, and you're going to see that big blob of green pop up on radar across much of Middle Tennessee and Southern Kentucky. This right here, uh, this all is not actual rainfall. You're going to see it pop up right there. So that is not rain. Most of the rain is actually down here in our southern and eastern counties. That is just about to exit our viewing area as well. Current radar image from 10.04. That's the current time. Still seeing a few showers lined up just in our very, very far eastern counties. This is Cumberland County right here. Crossville still seeing some mainly light showers, uh, just a couple of pockets of moderate rainfall just to the east of uh, Crossville right now. And then a little bit further south of that, this is that big storm that was moving through Coffee County, brought some heavy rain to Manchester. It is dry in Manchester now. This storm has moved off into Grundy County outside of our viewing area. And then down there in parts of southern Bedford County, uh, still seeing just a couple of showers, not any lightning with that though. No severe weather threat for tonight, so we are not going to have to worry about any of that for tonight. This is all cleared on out of here. A busy night down on Broadway too tonight. 78 degrees. That's our current temperature. Still seeing some clouds out there. It's going to get hot next week. More details on that coming up for you here in just a bit. Continuing coverage now with several Americans wrongfully detained in Russia for some cases years are now back on U.S. soil after a historic prisoner swap. Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gerskovich and former U.S. Marine Paul Whelan are among those released. Now, it quickly turned political as former President Donald Trump criticized the White House over this case, suggesting the Biden administration paid to get the deal done. The White House denies that claim, saying that they are simply bringing home prisoners taken by Russia during Mr. Trump's presidency. Trevor Reed was taken in the previous administration's uh, uh, time in office. Mis Mr. Biden got him home. Uh, Paul Whelan was taken in the previous administration's uh, time in office. President Biden got Paul home. 
Former President Trump claims that he didn't give other countries anything in exchange for Americans during his administration, but he approved the release of prisoners for swaps at least four times. The 2024 Paris Olympics nearly halfway over and Team USA still leads the overall medal count. Right now, America has 43 total medals. That includes nine gold medals, 18 silver medals, and 16 bronze medals. The Paris Olympics run through August 11th. We will soon learn who Vice President in politics. Vice President Kamala Harris getting closer to announcing a decision about her running mate. Well, governors are the main contenders with Pennsylvania's Josh Shapiro emerging as a top choice for many Democrats. Fox 17 News Atra El Nishar digs into how Shapiro could impact the race for the Oval Office. It was less than two years ago, then Pennsylvania Attorney General Josh Shapiro was elected governor of one of the most politically consequential states in the nation. I am so proud to be a Pennsylvanian. Now, Vice President Kamala Harris is considering whether he can help deliver her a victory in November. I hope you're with me. Let us get to work. Thank you. Shapiro has obvious advantages. He's a popular leader of the critical swing state that carries 19 electoral votes. A recent poll by Emerson College in the Hill finds 49% of Pennsylvanians approve of his job as governor, just 31% disapprove. So would Shapiro bring a home state advantage to the Harris ticket? We have shown that we can tackle big things here in Pennsylvania. Research from past elections shows there's usually only a small, if any, impact from a VP candidate coming from a swing state. Take the 2012 Republican ticket. Mitt Romney's running mate Paul Ryan didn't deliver his home state of Wisconsin. Then President Obama won there by more than 200,000 votes. But if Shapiro brought even a small boost, it could be enough to tip the state for Democrats. In 2020, Biden pulled off a victory in Pennsylvania by only about 81,000 votes. And in 2016, Trump won by just 44,000 votes. But to some progressives, Shapiro comes with baggage. And we stand with Israel. This new no genocide Josh campaign calls for signatures to tell Harris and Democrats no to Josh Shapiro, criticizing his crackdown of pro-Palestinian campus protests and opposition to a ceasefire in Gaza, certain to resonate in another battleground state, Michigan, home to one of the largest Arab populations in the country. Whether Shapiro is Harris's pick or not, He's expected to be with her at her first rally with her running mate on Tuesday night because it's being held in his home state. The Philadelphia rally will kick off a five day swing state blitz for the new Democratic ticket in Washington. I'm Atrell Nashar. Would you consider an AI romantic relationship? It's a growing trend and I've got the details coming up. We had some showers and thunderstorms move through earlier today. I think next week, though, is looking totally opposite of what we've seen recently. Gas giant plans to make the move to Texas before the end of the year. Meanwhile, chipmaker Intel cutting a whopping 11% of its massive workforce. That's about 15,000 jobs. The company is trying to turn its business around to compete with rivals like NVIDIA and AMD. Babies R Us shops will start to appear in Kohl's this fall. They'll pop up over the next few months. This as the retailer launches more of the 200 total in-store Babies R Us shops. It said earlier this year it planned to add at Kohl's. The retailer said the first of the Babies R Us at Kohl's sections have already launched. Kohl's said it aimed to make Babies R Us shops interactive and feature items from 90 brands. Finally, Etsy announcing it will start testing its first ever loyalty program in an attempt to boost sluggish sales. Its stock price has lost close to 78% of its value since late 2021. Select customers will receive an invitation for Etsy Insider starting in September. It will offer free shipping across the U.S. along with access to discounts. C.J. Papa, Fox News. Well, new tonight, some people are turning to AI partners when looking for love. Strange but true. Fox 17 News' Janae Bowens tonight with more on this new trend. Many people thought AI would take away jobs, but it appears AI might be taking from the dating pool, too.
Excuse me, have you seen my boyfriend? 18 year old Tia Gupta's reel about her AI boyfriend went viral on Instagram. He's just so nice and the fact that he talks so well, so politely. The love struck teen lives in India and recently broke up with her human boyfriend, who she says wasn't emotionally available. She told me it led her to create a partner on ChatGPT, who she calls Rio. I used a prompt which said like, so you are supposed to act like my boyfriend. You are supposed to say her after every single thing. You're supposed to call me sweetheart, love. You're supposed to take care of you. And also you're supposed to act jealous when I talk about other guys. Gupta is not alone. According to data from Anderson Horowitz, AI companionship is becoming mainstream. Last year, only two AI companion companies made the list of top 100. There are now 10 across both web and mobile. We just need someone to talk to and somebody who's there to listen without any fights or discussions. Relationships are about mutuality, give and take, trust. Mental health expert with JustAnswer.com, Jennifer Kelman, has serious concerns about this trend. It's a warning sign. It's a red flag that something else is going on for them. Depression, anxiety, lack of emotional intimacy, lack of needs being met elsewhere, that they're looking externally in this way to get those needs met without questions asked. Gupta says it's like a long distance relationship and she's not really thinking about dating humans right now. AI boyfriends are the best and I would suggest everybody to get one and they should not, the girls should not settle for bare minimum, a guy who doesn't know how to communicate. 40% of people are open to AI relationships. That's according to a survey from top10.com. Over half of respondents are really creeped out by the idea. And this is interesting. 29% appreciated that an AI lover won't cheat on them. I'm Janae Bowens reporting. Summer already over for some students as schools across America are starting back up. The National Retail Federation reports families are expected to spend nearly $900 per student on average for back to school shopping. Most consumers say they're waiting for their local tax holiday to shop like our tax free holiday that we saw last weekend. At least 17 states are offering sales tax holiday periods on school related items. Fox 17 News is your back to school station and we want to see how you and your kids are getting ready for the new school year. And that's why we are asking what's in your backpack. Just take a picture of your child's backpack and all the cool stuff they've got stuffed inside. Submit your pictures to us. Just go to fox17.com and click chime in. You may just see your submission on TV. Looking ahead, former president. George W. Bush and Barack Obama will be the nation's uh, celebratory leaders when we turn 250. The United States of America marks that milestone on July 4th of next year, 2026. I guess the year after next. The former leaders, along with First Ladies Laura Bush and Michelle Obama, will serve as honorary co-chairs for the organization America 250, which Congress created back in 2016 to oversee this upcoming celebration. It's a milestone, 250. Organizers say the the partnership is meant to serve as an example of bipartisan cooperation during a time of great political division. We had some showers and thunderstorms roll through a little bit earlier today. Some of these were pretty strong, even a couple of severe thunderstorm warnings that had to be issued a little bit earlier for us earlier this afternoon. The good news, though, <clears throat> this is not really going to be anything at all that we have to worry about through the overnight hours. There was that severe weather threat earlier today that has left us though. We have been removed from that severe weather threat. I'll show you that map coming up here in just a second. All this green that you're seeing, I've been pointing this out. Just a lot of clutter that's popping up on radar. That's not actually rain. A few areas are still seeing some showers. Really not much thunderstorm activity now though at all. Here's our current radar image 1018. Just a few of these showers um, down here in our southeastern areas. This is right here is in Cumberland County Crossville. Just seeing some light rain showers right there and then a little bit down to the south of that. This is that storm that was moving through Coffee County. It's now moved off into Grundy County outside of our viewing area and just seeing a few rain showers down there in southern portions of Bedford County and that's about it for right now and I don't think we're really looking at much more at all as we head through tonight either. Severe weather outlook. We have been removed from that level one risk. Not going to have to deal with any sort of severe weather threat through the overnight hours tonight and it's going to stay dry too. I don't think we're going to see much rain for tonight either. Nearly all dry for us early tomorrow morning. That's 7 a.m. We're going to 
to start out to a dry start tomorrow morning. By a little bit later in the afternoon, by mid to late afternoon, maybe a couple of isolated showers and storms along the plateau, but that's about it. Nearly all other locations that will be staying dry for Saturday. Sunday morning, we're off to another dry start, 7 o'clock, and then through set, uh, Sunday afternoon, maybe just an isolated shower at best, but we're not even going to put a rain chance in that seven day forecast for Sunday. I think uh, that rain chance is very, very slim on a Sunday. Moving on into Monday, just more of the same. It's plenty of sunshine dry for us on Monday. Tuesday, we're dry as well. We're going to start it out dry. We're going to stay dry through the rest of Tuesday. Moving on into Wednesday, Wednesday's dry, and then Thursday is just more of the same too. If you were watching earlier, I was talking about some of the long range models kind of veer off a little bit. By Friday, there is one set of models that does bring in a better rain chance. Another set that keeps us dry and actually bumps up our temperatures. So we'll get a better picture on that the closer we get. All these rounds of rain, though, has improved our drought situation along and north of I-40. Really not seeing any drought conditions. Level 2 drought for everybody, or level 1 drought for that shade of tan down there south of I-40. That area was in level 2 drought last Thursday. So the most recent map, that one right there, that came out yesterday, does show uh, way improving conditions from what we've seen over the past month and a half or so. 78 degrees, our current temperature in Nashville. A lot of folks out there on Broadway. Not going to have to really deal with any bad weather through the overnight hours tonight, so that's good. Mid 90s Sunday, upper 90s for us on Monday. We're going to stay hot on Tuesday with highs remaining in the upper 90s. Mid 90s Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Weather Window, presented by the National Weather Desk. Several viewers submitted videos of a thunderstorm that produced a lot of lightning last night in Bristol, Tennessee, and Virginia. Here's a great perspective on the Saharan dust over the southern states this week. Taken from a passenger jet, you can see exactly where the dust ends and the sky clears. And Washington's Whidbey Island welcomed this Friday with a gorgeous sunrise. Want to see your weather photos and videos on TV? Click Chime In on this station's website to share. Well, taking off the pup list, the key player that... Tennessee Titans taking a big hit this week as we learn veteran wide receiver DeAndre Hopkins will be out at least a month with a knee injury. The team did get some good news today, however, as offensive lineman Nicholas Petit Frere is now healthy and back practicing with the Titans. Petit Frere passed his physical, which meant the Titans could officially remove him from the pup list, also known as the physically unable to perform list. He missed the first five practices of camp while rehabbing a knee injury. Petit Frere played in 19 games his first two seasons and is expected to compete for the starting right tackle spot right away. Tennessee Vols opening up preseason camp this week on Rocky Top and all eyes are on second year quarterback Nico Iamaliava. The red shirt freshman is expected to start at quarterback this season, marking his first season as the full time starter. He was ranked as the number one recruit in the class of 2023 by on three, but then he sat out last season under quarterback Joe Milton. Ian Maliava did start in the Citrus Bowl, however, for the Vols, where he threw four touchdowns in Tennessee's win over Iowa. Ian Maliava says he learned a lot from Milton last season and is excited to take that next step as a leader. I mean, when you got a guy like Joe in front of you, I feel like, you know, it's a great guy to learn from. You know, soak up as much as you can soak up. And, and uh, yeah, I enjoy learning from Joe and uh, this whole team, just, you know, how to be a leader. And uh, it was good for me to sit. As for the Commodores, the quarterback competition just now starting to heat up. Vanderbilt looking at four different QBs this camp. Utah transfer Nate Johnson and New Mexico State transfer Diego Pavier are expected to take the most snaps. And then returning scholarship quarterback Drew Dickey and New Mexico State transfer Blaze Berlowitz are also in the mix as well. Well, right now it's anyone's ball. You know, they got to come out and, and show the ability to protect the football, make good decisions, you know, um, empower the other 10 guys on the field to make plays. Um, and uh, we want to give them time and space to do that. Head coach Clark Lee also saying that the biggest challenge will be narrowing down the competition from four to just one starter. They have already have a strategy, though, in place on how they want to do that when it comes to dividing up reps. I'll have much more on the Commodores, Vols, and the Titans Sunday on Sports Overtime at 10, so be sure to join us then. Jill Jelnick, Fox 17 Sports, your Code Red Station.
In health news tonight, as more people are forced to return to the office, you know, following the pandemic after so long working from home, a growing trend is frustrating both managers and employees. Fox 17 medical reporter Liz Bonus explains why coffee badging is not good for the soul or the body. Hey there, everybody, this new trend business health specialists say is really bad for morale and maybe even hurting your odds of good health long term. It started because workers are being called back into the office after working from home in pandemic times. And they don't feel engaged there. They don't find a compelling reason to be in the office. So they show up. Business professor Beth Gifford of Ohio Cedarville University says just long enough to coffee badge. And then they, you know, they ghost the office and go back to work remotely from home or someplace else. So here's how coffee badging works. People come into work, got the badge all ready to go, got the coffee cup ready to go. You swipe the badge, go into the office, and of course, the first place you hit is where you can get your coffee. And of course, speak to maybe a few people around. Hi, Di. Hi, Liz. I'm not really sticking around very long. Okay, it's, that's fine. But coffee, it's really good. The danger in all this? This is really a leadership issue and not an employee issue. Beth says being engaged at work is contagious. If you don't feel like you need to be there. The risk is that others will see this and they won't feel engaged. She says no matter where you work, feeling needed, engaged, and that you contribute to a greater purpose is good for body, soul, stress reduction, and business. When we're in the office, we have the opportunity to be mentored by more experienced colleagues. Beth says rather than leaving work, ask a manager how you can become more engaged. And if a manager notices your coffee badging, that person too should ask. What can we do to change that for you? Part of the reason solving this is critical is that work stress is now linked to physical health concerns. One recent study found short term it can lead to headaches and sleep problems. Long term, however, high cholesterol and a higher risk of heart disease. With your health news, I'm Liz Bonus reporting. Impossible to do the coffee badging thing if you don't drink coffee, though. It makes it more challenging. <laughs> yeah, you show up for a minute. You could fill up your cup with something else. <laughs> <That's though>. Something. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Well, hey, you know, this is good news for us. We had the severe weather thread today. We were code red for the past few days. Uh, no code red weather for us tonight, so everything is all good for us.